Thank you very much for having me, Klaus, and everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be presenting today uh, a very little known tool uh, in the LLVM ecosystem and my own derivative work of it. The tool is called OptViewer. Uh, the continuation work by me is called OptView2. And what it aims to do is allow you to gain some visibility into compiler optimizations and uh, hopefully be able to do something about the compiler decisions when you don't like them. Um, about 30-40% uh, of the talk will be dedicated to demonstrations of the tool, how to interpret its results and uh, how to be able to intervene in them. So, what kind of feedbacks would I like to get from my compiler? I really hope uh, to be able to hear it say, um, you, you see this small function, the function that you know that is small and uh, you just assume you'd be inlined. Well, I couldn't even consider, I the compiler, couldn't even consider inlining it since I didn't see its definition. All I saw was its declaration. Apparently, your include tree is more complex than you imagined. And um, uh, uh, th this is why I didn't uh, inline this function. Would also love to hear um, all these expressions on the on this particular loop that seem very obvious to do, to you that stay constant. Uh, for example, the loop boundary. Uh, it's not that obvious to me that they stay constant. And just to be on the safe side, I again I the compiler keep reevaluating them on every loop iteration. Uh, uh, or, well, that's sort of a neighboring feedback. Um, I'm reloading this variable from memory into registers many, many times that uh, if you would have known, you could have say, you, you could have said that it was redundant, but I, um, I can't analyze that deep and uh, I keep accessing memory to update these variables. Um, now, this knowledge in some raw form or another was available for a long time via dedicated compiler switches in all major compilers. A Clang and GCC had RPAS. Uh, this is an example snippet of some output. Intel had a different switch at Microsoft in, uh, in very recent times. Um, very recently introduced uh, optimizations, added some uh, diagnostic switches as well. But this is what the output looks like. It's a wall of unstructured test, a text for you to sift through and try and prioritize and try to uh, associate with the relevant code and decipher and uh, see if anything needs to be done about it and what. The alternative, the, the more modern version of wrapping up this information, is this. The opt viewer tool uh, consumes diagnostic information generated by the compiler, uh, and then it renders HTMLs of the actual source code with the optimization diagnostics interleaved as optimization, as this colored text here. Uh, I know which I would rather to use, and I, I'm guessing you would too. Presentation does matter. Uh, and the guy who first understood it in this context is called Adam Nimet. He's an uh, LLVM developer working at Apple. Uh, his work, the OptView work, uh, started in uh, 2016. Uh, and the original context of the work was Clang over Linux. This is the context in which uh, 
uh, I would focus here. Uh, I would dedicate some words towards the end, uh, one or two slides, to discussing other compilers as well. So, how, how does using this tool look? First, you build your code, uh, assuming you are able, you are normally building it with Clang, you just need to add one extra compiler switch. Switch is called dash f save dash optimization dash record. When you do, the compiler generates many opt YAML files by default alongside uh, your object files. This is a typical content, uh, just a snippet of some random such uh, YAML file. It contains, uh, you see, it contains raw data, uh, decorated names and uh, references to sources. This is uh, intended for consumption by a computer, not by a human being. And the second stage of the work is running a Python script called OptViewer. You tell this Python script, um, just a second, are you able to see my mouse? with this uh, sharing? Yes, we see it. OK. You tell this Python script uh, where are the YAMLs with the raw optimization, um, it's called optimization remarks, or uh, let's call it optimization records, where the YAMLs uh, are located. You tell it where the sources which these YAML, the YAMLs reference are located, and you tell it where you want the HTMLs to be generated. This Python script um, processes this, uh, it crunches them for admittedly a rather long while and generates uh, HTMLs of the type that uh, I showed you. This is a screenshot from a real output of um, OptViewer running on some uh, real code. Now I will take the time here to briefly discuss some features here which I won't discuss later. Uh, we will discuss very much in depth um, uh, these yellow comments, uh, these, this um, text that the compiler emits, but I want to talk a bit about these percents. These are what's called uh, hotness indications. If you are lucky and you're able to build your code with PGO, with profile guided optimization, uh, you have extra info that the opt viewer tool is able to use to help you say what's important and what isn't. PGO is outside the scope of this talk, but very briefly, um, it is. Um, an extended flow of a build. PGO stands for Profile Guided Optimization. Essentially, first you build an instrumented version uh, of your binary, you then run it through some uh, designated uh, workflows or scenarios. The instrumented binary does collect uh, uh, performance counters and uh, uh, various branch flows in the uh, metadata throughout the run, and then uses it in the third and final stage of rebuilding the binary using this information. So as a side effect of this process, you do have some rough profiling data. You're able to say that, um, uh, relatively speaking, uh, this line uh, 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 the code uh, spent half as much time here than it spent here, which is very useful when you're trying to uh, sift your way through many thousands of such remarks. And now, uh, you know what, already a natural question might arise. You see these two optimization remarks relate to the same for loop line. And yet this remark carries just a 52% hotness and this remark carries 100% hotness while they refer to the same code line. 
the reason is here. This column is called inlining context. This code snippet is part uh, of a function which might, uh, in principle and in practice, is inlined into many other functions. And after inlining, uh, it can undergo very, very different uh, optimization passes and uh, optimizing can, uh, each one of these passes can take very different transformation decisions. And so this comment, uh, this uh, vectorization uh, remark is relevant to this code after it was inlined into PROC8. This optimization remark is relevant after uh, the, this code was inlined into PROC0. This is the inlining context here. The text here is the name of the optimization pass. LLVM works in uh, transformation passes after um, uh, the front end of Clang translates C++ code into IR. Uh, the green background says that these optimizations succeeded. The red one says that these optimizations failed. And why? We will go in uh, considerable depth into uh, into uh, optimization remarks of this latter kind. Uh, okay, th this is just some uh, technical comment. If you do, as I hope, get to try this tool, I I encourage you um, to not make do with the default installation, but inst uh, the OptVR tool uses a Python package called PyYaml, which grows substantially more efficient if you uh, install it while libyaml is already present on the machine. So learn from my mistakes and uh, do this first. Before we go on any further, um, this is just uh, the broad context of the talk. Are there any questions Already, I'll be glad. I'll be glad to try and answer. So we do have a question already. Yes, um, Hani's asking: Can OptVR be used in projects building with GCC compilers? That's an excellent question. Um, I will have a slide and a half dedicated this towards the end. Um, actually, I don't mind skipping to it uh, right now. Just a second. About two years after um, after the Clang work, and uh, David Malcolm of the uh, GCC uh, development community uh, actually implemented a nearly identical work uh, in the GCC uh, compiler. Uh, the, compi the compiler switch which generates the optimization records file is identical. It's F save uh, optimization record. Um, the Python script which processes it, it's different. It's in his private repository. It's not part of the GCC uh, official repo. Um, it's because the, the compiler generates uh, JSON files, and not YAML files, which is actually a much more a reasonable choice for various technical reasons. Um, this repo was active only in 2018. I was able to um, to use it on some small code repositories, but I, the, the demos that I'm about to do are, are on a hefty code repository. It's an OpenCV, and I wasn't able to run it on OpenCV. So I can't say categorically that uh, it's uh, unusable. Sorry, that's actually bad phrasing, saying it's unusable. You might have luck. It might be usable in your context. Uh, I did uh, open an issue at David's um, GitHub repo. I do hope very much uh, that we can revive this work. I think it's great work. I think it's very valuable uh, to us as developers. 
but but the the answer the answer is to, to whether you can use this on GCC. The answer is maybe. If I had to guess, probably not. Okay, so a definitive maybe. All right, thanks. Great. I think this answers the question. Okay, this was it. This was the only one. Please continue. Great, thank you. So. Um, if I had to guess, uh, none of you guys ever heard of OptViewer, which is a bit sad, but also surprising. I think this is great work. Uh, it was uh, presented in 2016, uh, wasn't, didn't gain much uh, traction. Um, it is deployed. If you have Clang, you have this tool on your machine. But um, there isn't much activity at this dark corner of the LLVM repo. And I can't say I know why, but I can speculate. Um, it is extremely heavy, running on a real life size project with, uh, uh, let's say, an order of magnitude of a million lines. Uh, can bring to its knees uh, a very large server. It consumes many tens of gigs of RAM. It uh, generates HTMLs in sizes that break browsers. It's not pleasant to work with. And it was presented at a compiler authors convention, not a developers conference. And I I get the impression that it was designed for compiler authors in mind. It contains tons of information that for me as a developer are mostly noise. I don't care about many internal uh, optimization diagnostic info that this tool presents. Uh, and I have to spend a lot of work and time fishing out from this sea of info, the bits that are relevant to me. So we need to do something to improve this signal to noise ratio. We need to do something to make this compiler developers tool into a general developers tool. So let's uh, start to do this something. Uh, this is a link to a GitHub repo that tries to take the first steps in this direction. Call this OptView2. What I did there, uh, well, uh, it, built, it, it built up to many things, but first of all, I collect only optimization failures. I don't care about the optimizations that succeeded. I ignore system header. I might sometimes care about them. Sometimes I might have actionable items when using a standard library of functions, but most of the time I don't. Um, I remove tons of duplicities. I do lots of other things. Um, and I am able to reduce the, the info content of, content of the output by around two orders of magnitude. Um, and I think, in fact, we can do better, but this is where it stands currently. Uh, I, as a compiler user, not as a compiler developer, don't care too much about passes. Um, with the help of my friend uh, Ilan Ben Hagai, who sent a pull request recently, uh, he's done a great deal uh, for the for the JavaScript tables that display that index this information and some other stuff is going on there. Uh, I'll show it to you soon. No, I'll show it to you now. This is uh, Klaus. Are you able to see my browser? Yes, we are. Okay. This is the index. Uh, of a run on some subfolder of OpenCV. This is the index of OpenCV modules folder. You can see here the distribution of various categories of optimization remarks, and you can see the 
det uh, some details and uh, link to the exact code here. Uh, this is the HTML of the source annotated with optimization remarks here. Um, uh, for convenience and not to overburden the, the browser, uh, I don't by default display all. In this particular case, all is not too much, so I can display all if I want to. Uh, yes. Um, and I can sort by uh, any, uh, any of the columns. I can also filter them um, both in this page and in an external config file. Um, but let's let's take the time to click two random ones. Um, OK, here's a very easy optimization remark. Um, this kind function will not be inlined into getMat into my function because its definition isn't available. Uh, now, some judgment needs to be exercised, uh, and I'm not an OpenCV developer, so I cannot say if inlining kind is, seems a reasonable thing to do or not. Uh, if I am, if I know that I'm looking at some performance bottleneck, then I will very favorably consider uh, making the definition of kind available uh, at this point. Um, that was easy. I wish all of those feedbacks, all of those optimization remarks was uh, that easy. Um, but some are not. Um, let's take, uh, you know, the most common one is no definition. Uh, that's, that's typically because um, many definitions of uh, standard library functions are not available. Uh, after you filter the standard library out, the most common definition is typically variations of load clobbered. Uh, load clobbered one shows something like this. Load of type I64 not eliminated because it is clobbered by invoke. And this magic incantation calls for some deciphering and uh, actually studying it in detail uh, can turn out to be kind of hard in the, in the context of real code and uh, luckily we can do this in a lab not just any lab the, the best lab that c++ developers can have which is a uh, godbolt if i go um, to, a, to a compiler explorer page. If I'm using a Clang developer, a, a Clang uh, compiler, why aren't I using the latest one? Doesn't matter, just I think it should be the default. I can add new optimization output. Uh, let's rearrange that. And uh, this uh, nice little pane, uh, it doesn't show interleaved comments in the source, it, show, it, it shows them as colored sidebar. If I hover above uh, these colored uh, sidebars, I can see the exact same output that I would see if running OptViewer on this source. Uh, the green ones are uh, test optimizations, the red ones are failed ones, which is mostly what I, what I will focus on. So the, the next five to ten minutes we'll spend in Compiler Explorer examining 
missed optimizations with this new uh, tool. So let's start by looking at this silly loop. I get pointed to an array of 10 ints. I get an increment to them. I loop on this uh, array and I want to add B to each one of these 10 slots. Now, if I were to manually uh, generate assembly for this code, I would say something like uh, load B from memory into a register and then loop 10 times on the contents of uh, A and add B from the register into every one of them. If you're an uh, experienced C or C++ developer, then you can probably already spot the problem. Uh, luckily for us all, the compilers are vastly smarter than I am. And the compiler is able to say that this is a mistake because what happens if B is actually was passed in as a, A4? If this is the case, then after the fourth, the fifth iteration of this loop, B itself would change and the value uh, that would increment A5 until A9 would have to be different. And the compiler has no visibility into the call site and it must account for this possibility. And so the compiler loads B from memory 10 times. It loads B from, uh, from the argument location into the, regist the register EAX and add it to A0. Loads it again and adds it to A1, etc., etc. Now, now we have uh, the ability to, to see this without inspecting this assembly. So, uh, inspecting this assembly is completely unfeasible for uh, large projects, at, at least without knowing where to look. And right here, uh, I know where to look because the compiler optimization records tell me this load, load of type I32, the reloading of B, we wish that it could be eliminated but it cannot, it cannot be eliminated because it is clobbered by store. This store, the store into AI, potentially clobbers B. And so forces the compiler to reload it from memory. Now, in this very simple example, um, there are easy things to be done about this. Um, if you ever heard of restrict, then you would be surprised. This declaration with restrict tells the compiler B uh, is the only way within the, the scope of this function to access the memory pointed to by B is through the name B. In other words, B does not alias. There is no other name for the memory occupied by B. B and A do not alias. What this um, non-standard Clang and GCC keyword does is help the optimizers alias analysis. And I would like actually to take this opportunity to say one more thing. Uh, typically, when I show it, a natural question arises, who cares? You know, after the first or maybe second time you uh, load from memory into a register, uh, this, the next nine accesses to memory are not really accesses to memory. These are accesses to cache 
that um, that can in most circumstances can be uh, completely neglected. This is true, but forcing the compiler to uh, constantly reload uh, from memory to registers after each iteration inhibits other optimizations. What happened here is that after uh, informing the compiler that B in fact does not change between these iterations, the compiler was able to vectorize this code. And this is a big deal. In performance sensitive numeric code, this is a very big deal. Okay, uh, enough with this example. But I'll stay here for a second. Uh, are there any questions on this example? So right now we don't have any new questions. Okay. So I think this was perfectly clear. Thank you. Perhaps I do have a question passing by value. So instead of uh, declaring this as restrict, just doing a plain copy of this int would probably have the same effect, right? Yes, it would. Okay. Okay, pretty much Definitely. the same assembly code. Yes. Uh, um, uh, uh, I just say again that uh, this is a toy code, this is lab code. In uh, real life, uh, very rarely in C++ do we pass around int pointers anymore. But uh, you do get instances, uh, actually very many instances, where um, you get, uh, you pass classes by references and use their members and um, it's much more involved in real life, but the essential semantics are often identical to this. So uh, in practice, what limits did you find uh, using Compile Explorer for real code? Because your real code tends to be large, hence the, these many, many um, um, output messages. Does it work for bigger code, pieces of code, or are you restricted to pretty small um, kernels um, I, I'm not sure I understood the the question okay. does it work in what in what way I mean uh, I um, do compile Explorer does the same thing kind of but um, you cannot upload uh, large projects into compile Explorer so in your experience how well does it work for slightly bigger code examples uh, it works just as well I mean the compiler and opt viewer work uh, exactly as well my own human ability to interpret the result uh, is somewhat hampered. It takes uh, considerably more work uh, to be able to, um, to understand the flow that led to this optimization, to these missed optimizations reported here. Um, I actually uh, recently mailed Adam and the guys uh, asking whether it was feasible um, to incorporate variable names in these messages because very often load of type I32 is not enough to uh, deduce directly what the compiler means by that. Um, Sometimes I, I'm successful in uh, interpret interpreting these results, sometimes not. The more I do it, uh, the more successful I get. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you, great question. No. Okay. Um, and this is, um, this is a distribution of um, optimization remarks that I get from a real life uh, project. Aliasing dominates. Load clobbered of various subtypes clearly dominates. I've seen this in uh, more than one project. So 
this is very probably worth the effort to get into. Guys, are you able to see me? So yes, your slides are back. OK. Let's inspect another one, clobbered by core. Here's another two example. Let's take 10 seconds to digest it. I have a silly function here that accepts uh, an int by value. No complications there. Uh, does something which is not visible here with this int. Increments it, calls something else. Increments it again, calls nothing else. Increments it again, calls something else. If I were to generate assembly manually from this code, um, the first thing I do was take I and increment it by three directly. Um, actually, after thinking this through, I'd probably drop I altogether. After calling some func, it seems very clear that I is unused. This is not what happens. You can see uh, Compiler Explorer very conveniently color codes the source line and the assembly lines. So you can see that uh, this line uh, is this increment, this line is a separate increment, the green line is another yet separate increment. Uh, and just looking at this assembly, it's, uh, well, for me, it's very hard to speculate on why. So let's try to get more info here. Yes, I'm hovering near the line of this I++, which tells me there is a missed optimization here. Load of type I32 not eliminated. In favor of store, never mind that, because it is clobbered by call. Now, this one is more tricky. Uh, there's essentially only one. Uh, no, that's not true. There are two candidates as to what call the compiler is talking about. But it seems that the call the compiler is referring to is this nothing call. How can that be? What, what is the compiler afraid of? How can the increment of I be impacted by the call to nothing? So to cut a long story short, what happens is that some func takes an int reference. And at this point, the address of I has leaked outside the scope of the function f. And many, many crazy things might happen now. Uh, some func can store the address of i in some global or some static, or some place that is reachable from some singleton, and nothing might access this function, uh, this location, and so nothing, uh, once the address of i has leaked beyond the scope of f, nothing might be sensitive to the value of i. And I cannot uh, eliminate the values of uh, the increments of i, um, nor can I unify them to one increment by three. Uh, I hope this makes some sense. I will uh, soon take questions, uh, but let's take uh, one or two steps further. What can we do about it? Um, first, uh, if we pass by value, of course, this doesn't happen. As I 
we would have hoped initially AI is eliminated altogether. Um, uh, another trick that uh, a colleague showed me uh, that might be useful in real life code is this. What happened here is a bit more subtle. It seems like the semantics are unchanged, but they are. What in fact happens here is that I am passing to some func a temporary object. Some func, the signature of some func uh, is it, it accepts constant by reference. It can bound to a temporary object and extend, extend its lifetime. And yet the address of the original I does not leak outside, and the compiler is able to optimize I away. A third thing uh, that partially works is I wish I could tell the compiler that some funk does none of the crazy stuff that uh, I was afraid of. It does not store the address of uh, its argument into some global state. Now this may be um, too high resolution for a statement, but I want to say that some function does not alter global state in any way. That is to say, some func is a pure function. The syntax for this exists. The impact is not as I hoped. Uh, the attribute pure does um, deliver to Clang the information that some func does not alter any global state. Uh, LLVM is currently not smart enough to use this attribute for this uh, extra optimization. By the way, GCC. GCC could use uh, this attribute uh, to optimize. I actually opened an issue about this at the LLVM repo. Hopefully something can be done about it. Okay. Okay. There's one more major thing that I want to say about aliasing, but uh, let's stop for questions again. Um, Klaus, uh, are there any more questions? There are a couple of questions. So, indeed, two questions. Um, so, Stefan is asking. Um, does this also work with what happens with link time optimization? I wish it would. In principle, when you do link time optimization, uh, the needed information is available to the optimizer. It can pick inside these functions and decide whether they uh, alter global state in dangerous ways or not. Um, based on, on my experience so far, it just doesn't. All right, fair, fair answer, absolutely. All right, uh, and Kirchia is asking, does Clang provide some kind of auto fix in, in quotation marks option? So for example, does Clang add the restrict keyword to uh, any parameter itself? Is this possible? No, no, uh, it would be, I think it would be outside its mandate to do so, but Actually, I don't know whether uh, in LTO after inlining that actually might be standard conformant. Uh, after inlining, uh, uh, I do see the equivalent of uh, restrict. Mm -hmm. I do th see these optimizations. Um, when you run with LTO, 
uh, you have more inlining. Mm -hmm. You have cross translation unit inlining, so you see more of that. Um, but other than that, uh, I mean, in this scenario, when all Clang can see is uh, this function in translation unit without visibility into, into the caller, then uh, it can't. Yeah. It will just break the C++ semantics. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK. Um, OK, so we did discuss some countermeasures. Uh, actually, someone uh, went ahead of me and asked about LTO. I don't have in-depth knowledge of compiler internals, but empirically it doesn't help. We did discuss restrict, which does help in this uh, very restricted <laughs> scenario where you want to address the aliasing of an argument, which is not always the case. There are two attributes, attribute pure and attribute const, that should work, and I still have hope that one day they would, but currently in Clegg they mostly don't. And the last thing that I wanted to discuss uh, in this context of aliasing is a rather broad topic called strict aliasing. Um, strict aliasing is a permission we give the compiler to assume that two objects do not alias, do not refer to the same chunk of memory, if these two objects have different types. Uh, let, let me demonstrate, say here, you see this is the unoptimized code. If I change the type of one of the sides, the optimization kicks in. The compiler is now allowed to assume that uh, these arguments do not alias. Uh, that sounds mighty useful. Um, okay, Charles, there is an exception. Never mind that. Never mind disabling it. So, what I want to be able to do, and what I tried for actually a long time to be able to do, is to force difference of types. Changing an int to a long is nice, but if I have um, 10 different ints, 10 different members in some struct that I want to say won't alias each other, uh, then this trick would get me only so far. So type def doesn't work. Yeah, if I type def uh, int twice into two separate names, I did not create two uh, distinct types now. I created two uh, synonyms, two new synonyms for int. The compiler cannot see it, that there are different types now. Um, I actually tried to inherit int. That might seem ridiculous, but why can't you? Um, I actually found some uh, reference by Bjarne said that uh, he did consider it for a while, but uh, too many dark corners of the C legacy uh, kicked in and uh, prevented it. There are no strong type defs in C++. Uh, there are uh, quite a few libraries that try to uh, mimic it. Um, I had no success with any of them. Uh, I think I'm demonstrating you something called boost type left. Yeah. Uh, if I do, if I replace the int here and int here with boost strong, strong type def, this is an ancient uh, construction that comes from boost serialization. This is a library. I think it's pre C++ 11. Uh, 
but I tried it with um, I tried it with uh, more modern libraries as well, and I didn't see success. Uh, what I aim at, that's not entirely true. I see, I saw partial success. Sometimes strong type depths of this kind did uh, help, but what always works is wrappers wrapping my ins and structs and accessing them through one extra level of indirection. If I take um, my two ins and wrap them in different structs. This is a change to the code, uh, but this change does succeed. In under these semantics, the compiler can infer that uh, a dot v and dot dot v do not alias. Optimizations do kick in. Code seems a bit longer, but it's uh, essentially due to loop unrolling here. The loop body is vectorized as it was before. Okay. Uh, we'll briefly discuss that, but before that, uh, uh, are there questions about strict aliasing? So right now there's no uh, questions in the chat. Excellent. Okay. The third and last category of optimization remarks that I want to go into in some depth here is uh, loop hoisting. Well, uh, the text is failed to move load with loop invariant address because the loop may invalidate its value. Um, I don't have a toy uh, uh, Godbolt example here, so I'll just tell you a story about uh, this piece of code. <clears throat> uh, where can we see here a load with loop invariant address? Um, there's actually only one candidate, and that's here. Boundaries end. Uh, it would seem natural to move the load of boundaries end outside the loop and evaluate it, that is, uh, load it from the memory into the register only once. But we, the compiler failed to do it because it failed to prove that the loop body does not uh, change the boundary uh, the boundaries end value. Sorry. The same goes inside the loop body. This L2 gradient, uh, to a human reader, it might seem very obvious that it stays fixed. There's nothing, uh, I'm telling you, and I hope you would believe me, there's nothing around here in the loop body that might have uh, changed it, but the compiler cannot prove it, and so it loads it from memory uh, on each loop iteration. Now, this code is part of a class method. Boundaries and L2 gradient are members. Um, and as such, you know that this pointer uh, leaks outside the method scope very, very easily. Inside the loop body, many, many other methods uh, can be called and uh, it can be very hard to positively prove that none of them change global state. Well, typically they do change global state, but not uh, these members. And the compiler, current compilers give up on this uh, global state analysis rather easily. Uh, and say I can't prove that these members are not uh, changed and I'm reloading them from memory on every iteration. Now, we already have a few tools in our disposal to uh, counter this state, but I want to suggest another. What we can do is make these members non-members. We can make them local. Uh, 
not what I wanted to do. Sorry, Klaus, am I still sharing? Are you able to see my screen? You're still sharing. Right now we okay. see the slides. Thank you. So, all I'm doing in this snippet is copying the member boundaries, not the entire member, just boundaries.end into a local int, and the same for L2 gradient. And these optimization complaints are gone. Yes, remember the text failed to move load with loop invariant address. There is no more failure to move load with loop invariant address. This end cannot be affected by the loop body. Its address cannot leak outside. Same goes for this member, for this local copy of the member, local L2 gradient. Now, it needs to be emphasized. This is not good C++ code. This is not something that I would encourage you to uh, run around in your code and fix just because OptViewer uh, complained about it. Uh, this is something to do only if you are certain, A, that you are inspecting um, a real performance bottleneck, uh, some very tight loop, and B, that after experimenting, you actually see a measurable improvement. I hope we live to see the day that compilers are smart enough uh, not to require such ugly uh, hacks to improve uh, the optimization, but the day is not here yet. So just be aware of this option in case you need it. Uh, okay, any question about this example? No, no new questions. Okay. We actually discussed this uh, GCC work uh, ahead of time. Uh, so I'll skip it. And um, I, uh, no other compilers have uh, a parallel tool, unfortunately. Not GCC, not uh, Intel, not uh, MSVC that, that I know of. But uh, I did play around with other compilers while trying to uh, apply the conclusions from Clang investigations to other compilers. And I often uh, saw sorry good results so if you are able to build your code or even just parts of your code in clang uh, i can recommend doing it and filtering the code through opt viewer through opt view 2 and at the very least it would point you in the right direction at the very very least it would tell you where typically compilers, and good chance your compiler too, uh, fail to apply optimizations that might otherwise seem natural. Okay, the last thing I want to say is um, what more should and hopefully will be done uh, on the OptView 2 tool. Uh, I want to offer richer filtering abilities um, to improve the signal to noise ratio. It is still heavy. It, uh, it on servers, uh, it can take uh, half an hour to run on my work project, on my home laptop, it can take some hours. I do want to make it run on Windows. I, I do mean um, on Clang builds, but Currently, it doesn't run on Windows. That's actually should be a rather easy one. Um, Clang does have the option to output not YAML textual files, but binary optimization uh, ones. And I hope someday to be able to consume them. I think this 
does hold some promise for uh, uh, making the runs faster and lighter. Um, I hope we can revive GCC Opt Viewer, either ourselves or uh, with the help of his, its original author, David Melkor. Um, if we do get OptView to, to be part of some real, uh, let's say, automated workflow, some uh, CI flow, um, I would like to be able to add designated comments in some format that say essentially something along the lines of, Dear uh, OptView, don't complain here. I, I investigated this, I understood it. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, ignore um, this optimization remark on this particular line. And uh, I, I'm already using it to report to LLVM missed optimizations. Uh, there are actually quite a f I get the impression that there are actually quite a few of those lurking around, and they were uh, lurking around in the shadows until now. Now we can more easily point some light at them. Uh, there's lots of work ahead, there's lots of help needed. The project is uh, on its very early stages. And I uh, encourage all of you to give it a run, download it, uh, use it as part of, uh, give it a test run on your code. Tell me how it goes. Uh, tell me whether you had problems with it, whether you're having pro uh, problems interpreting the results, and even more importantly, tell me if it does work. I'm really eager to hear. Um, OK. I took five more minutes than uh, I was allotted. So let's end this now. Uh, thank you very much for listening. If there are more questions, I'll be very happy to try and answer. All right, Stan, first of all, thanks a lot for giving the talk. And we do indeed have a couple of new questions. I start with Roy's comment, slide 28. Um, here, yes, so uh, Roy simply says no raw loops. And I kind of transfer this into a question. Um, I, I think this was the intent. Did you try to use uh, STL algorithms? Did this help? Uh, do you experience the same, uh, or do you get the same um, uh, output from the tool, or does the compiler have a little more information? Um, I had mixed results with them. Mm -hmm. I think in this particular loop, uh, I think using for each didn't work, but occasionally it does. In this particular case, I think it's, it did work because both the loop boundaries uh, and the loop body um, involved members, the same method uh, of the same uh, class. So the danger of leaking addresses uh, still holds. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's a very good point, and I actually uh, should add uh, an item on this to my slides because sometimes it does help. Okay. For each does accept loop boundaries uh, by value. Mm -hmm. Gives a, at least one concrete example how it might help. Just to answer um, Rice's question. Um, so, in, in which situation would an algorithm be appropriate or better? That is an excellent question, but uh, I don't want to give an answer without investigating it further. Okay, a fair, fair answer, absolutely. All right, and uh, CP, CPPAL has a question. Uh, is this tool available when using MSVC with Clang as its build tool? Um, not really, that's uh, what I meant by run on Windows. Um, as far as I can say, the only real bar barrier is um, the function name demangling tool. Mm -hmm. Currently, the tool currently um, 
Uh, the script uses C++ Filt, which uh, is a Linux only tool. Um, uh, Windows come, uh, the, the MSVC toolchain tool chain comes with, um, I think, and name, but it doesn't, it doesn't digest uh, Clang mangled name properly. It digests only MSVC mangled names. Uh, I see some uh, options around for tools that are usable on Windows and can consume Clang mangled name. Um, but they're just not in place yet. Okay. And the uh, help uh, on this uh, is very, very welcome. CPP, sorry, what, what was the name of the Oscar? CPPEL. CPPEL, come no, join the party. CPPEL. So uh, CPPEL, just join us in the after talk chat, then we might already set up a, uh, a, a cooperation. Yeah, it, it's very doable. It just wasn't done yet. All right. So we can take it even further. Maybe, uh, I don't know, implement a Visual Studio um, plugin, what's that terminology, extension yeah. um, to process it. It just wasn't done. All right. All right, this is it from what I see. So I just see, um, thank you very much a lot. Um, else, yeah, so I, I basically now join this discourse. Thank you very much. And thank for you very you, much for having me. Yeah. And for all of you, um, I just posted a link to our MOOC Plus Plus After Talk chat. If you want to, you are coolly invited and we're very happy to, to welcome you to this After Talk chat. So have a great evening and Ofek, thanks again.